I'm Adam Rice, and you're listening to Pocket Change. In today's episode, I speak with Pavlina Cherneva, who's an associate professor and chair of the economics department at Bard College. In today's episode, we mostly focus on the job guarantee proposal, which is a core policy proposal for MMT. I hope you enjoy it. Pavlina, thanks so much for joining the show. I guess to, to get started, would you mind just describing your background a little bit and how you came to MMT, how you got involved in MMT originally? Thanks, Adam. Good to be with you. Uh, yes, I was an economics student and in college, I had this very interesting internship opportunity. I uh, worked for Warren Mosler, who now you know as the father of MMT, so to speak. But at the time, Warren was seeking academic communities to talk to. He had some ideas that um, he got from his uh, life as a practitioner. So he was looking for a researcher to basically situate some of his ideas into a school of thought. And I came from a post keynesian background. My teachers, uh, an undergraduate school were uh, post keynesians And so um, that's how I got connected to Warren and everything changed since, you know, after, after working that summer for him. I did a critical review of his so-called soft currency economics and then I developed a little math model on, on it. And from then on, I was just really interested not just at the theoretical level of how this just completely changes everything I've learned. But I've always been interested in the policy implications of economics, and this just really opened the possibilities in new ways. What would you say your current focus is uh, under the MMT umbrella? Or not under the MMT umbrella, but what would you say your current academic focus is? Well, right now, I'm almost exclusively focusing my work on the job guarantee proposal on um, fleshing out some of the theoretical you know, arguments for it, comparing the job guarantee to the current way we do business and we deal with unemployment, and specifically developing a, a blueprint for the United States, what might it look like if we were to attempt something like that in the U.S. In, in some ways, that focus has not changed initially, that interest in the job guarantee, we used to call it an employer of last resort, was a bit more esoteric. It, it had to do with this, this connection between money and unemployment and how the state can establish sort of a, a, an alternative you know, price anchor. But the human face of unemployment has always been important for me in my work. And so... Right now, that's that's basically the, the, the practical reality of, of how it impacts people's lives, the cost of unemployment, and what it might look like in the U.S. Gotcha. So I've had Randy Ray and Warren Mosler on the show. Surprisingly, we have not covered the job guarantee a ton, um, even though it's pretty core to MMT. So do you mind um, just giving the big picture vision of what the job guarantee is? Surely. The job guarantee is... Put simply, a program, it's a proposal to have a standby program that will employ the unemployed, rain or shine. Whether the economy is strong or weak, it simply offers a public service employment opportunity at a base living wage to anyone who wants it. Now, as a, as a, as a proposal... As a jobs proposal, it you know it has a whole number of benefits, but it does derive from MMT. It you know it, it's born out of MMT in a very particular way, and you know one of the arguments that we make is that in a sense unemployment is a monetary phenomena. It is it is quite unique in the sense that. In a monetary production economy, in a capitalist economy, in a market economy, where everything is commodified, where people provide for their standard of living, their subsistence by earning money and buying things, 
Having access to money is crucially important. So when you don't, when you don't earn it, when you seek it and you want it, that is a type of monetary phenomena. But MMT adds another very crucial re- lens. MMT says that the monetary system, in a sense, is an extension of the state sovereign monetary powers. That the state plays a very crucial role in driving the monetary system, in creating a currency, in basically sorting out how, how these commodities will be priced and in what currency they'll be denominated. And because the state is the ultimate source of the currency, it is the only party that can resolve the problem of unemployment, ultimately. As a third point, the state also creates a, ki- a, a, a type of unemployment. And that's also a contribution from modern monetary theory. And that's the following, that if you have to pay some debts, some taxes, some fees, some dues that are non-reciprocal, like you can't af- escape them, they're unavoidable. And if those are imposed to you by the state in the currency that the state itself issues, then you're suddenly unemployed. You suddenly ask yourself, well, how do I earn the currency to satisfy my tax? And in this sense, unemployment is almost the original sin of the monetary system that the state, by by driving its currency, and you've explained this in previous podcasts, by imposing a tax, creating a demand for the currency, it does so by creating unemployment as defined by people seeking that currency and willing to do something to earn it. So you see, it is kind of a multifaceted monetary problem, unemployment is. And so then it is really incumbent on the state to resolve the very problem it has created. So this is the part that might be a bit esoteric and abstract, but it's truly essential in understanding to place the proper burden on the solution on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the public sector. And there are many, many other ways in which we can also make, make that argument that the state bears this responsibility, not the least of which is that the state is already responsible for dealing with the unemployed, tackling all of the social problems that derive from it. On a practical level, and I know there's several different proposals for you know how we go how we'd go about implementing a job guarantee program. In your opinion, what is the best version, and like what does that actually look like in the real world if it's implemented? Well, to me, the best version is one that maintains some steadfast principles, and for me personally, uh, those have to include a commitment that is a genuine commitment to provide employment to everyone who seeks it at any time of the business cycle, at any phase of the business cycle. A true job guarantee is one that is guided by this commitment to economic justice. And the way I see it is as defined by, you know, these economic rights, Uh, whether you take the second bill of rights by FDR, whether you take the universal declaration of human rights, you know, to me, that is the most compelling framework that, you know, no person who's willing to participate in the economy, who would like to do something useful for the community, who would like to earn income to support themselves and their families should be turned away. You know, that is a like the first principle, Uh, it's a moral principle, but, you know, luckily it has great many economic benefits. So the ideal practical version is going to make that commitment that's going to be ongoing, that's going to be permanent. You know, it's not going to be a a program to deal with a crisis. You know, we have a a great recession and let's create a few jobs. It's not going to be a program that's going to pilot, you know, some some direct job creation initiatives here and there. It is a, a law that guarantees the right to decent work at decent pay. Now, how are you going to go about implementing it? You know, there are a number of ways to do this, and I'm quite open to uh, different proposals. But uh, again, for me, the most compelling one is that it involves the public sector in a way that is quite significant. So it will be a federally funded program because just like any other safety net this would be an an employment safety net. You know, these have to be federally funded. But 
they have to be locally administered because the federal government just doesn't quite know what the actual problems are in the communities. So then how do you go about implementing this at the local level? You know, there are multiple models. I think a hybrid of some of these is probably the best way to go forward. You're going to use your localities, your municipalities, and you're going to say, okay, look, what kind of jobs do you need to get done? You have been waiting for a long time to get some, you know, some funding to do them. What are the, you know, the public areas that you have left neglected you know, can we mobilize the unemployed to help you do them? So you could involve the public, the, the local municip- municipal sector, as well as some local nonprofits, which are already there. They are already trying to fill some of these gaps that have been left behind by the public or the private sector. And in terms of the really, really practical ways in which we could do this in the U.S., you know, I always say, how about... We make the unemployment offices across the United States, which, by the way, are now called American Job Centers. You know, they were renamed under President Obama. How about if we make them true American Job Centers? What if we were to turn them into employment offices? You know, if you're, if you're an unemployed person and you go to that office seeking an unemployment check, you will have that option to get your unemployment insurance if you want. But that employment office is also going to have a whole bunch of employment opportunities for you in the area where you live, in the public service sector. And so that, to me, is the infrastructure that already exists that really we can, we can use. We don't have to sort of reinvent the wheel. We can use those offices to become sort of our warehouses of local jobs initiatives. And the third piece that I think... I want to stress is that I I think it's important to do these employment opportunities in the public service sector because because there are important public functions that states, localities, they need to fulfill, they need to meet, because the public sector in some ways has been neglected because of the shrinking of of government and funding, etc. But importantly, because the sector can provide employment opportunities that the private sector does not provide. It does things that the private sector doesn't have an incentive to do. So if the private sector has decided that they cannot employ six or seven million people, you know, those people are going to be left unemployed, then the public sector can employ them in the public service sector. You know, the the private sector doesn't really have the incentive to do that. And, you know, public service work is not work for profit. So... To me, these will be some of the important ingredients in what a program like that might look like in the United States. And you can just use, you know, some models and programs that we've had throughout history and just sort of adapt them to the modern day, like the, you know, the New Deal programs uh, during FDR, but certainly, you know, updated for the 21st century. Right. So what types of jobs, you know, separately from, you know, from from talking about a Green New Deal, what types of jobs do you envision? And I know it's kind of hard to answer, given that it's a distributed community based system. What types of jobs do you envision people taking through the job guarantee program? I mean, great many jobs. You know, I just envision, you know, a, like a planning phase of implementation where you can have for a year, you, you do these surveys, community surveys, and you try to sort out What are the specific things that a particular community needs? I mean, just, you know, look around and look at the sort of blight that you will see in some neighborhoods, some of the abandoned lots that need to be cleaned up, some small infrastructure projects that are, that, that need to be done. But apart from the Green New Deal, I do envision the job guarantee as a kind of a green jobs guarantee. In other words, it's not exactly the sort of large scale mobilization that is required to transform the entire economy to green energy production, etc. But it still is a green program in the sense that it tries to tackle these most pressing needs that communities face, which are environmental. So let me give you an example. You know, water runoff. Lots of communities have this problem. You know, we've paved over you know, uh, green spaces, there's no place for stormwater to go. It really taxes the local infrastructure. There are some small infrastructure investments that we can make, but on large scale throughout the United States to deal with this one particular problem. 
You know, look at what is happening in California and the fires that are ravishing the state. No, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. The Green New Deal began a very concerted effort of fire prevention and small investments to deal with fire prevention efforts. We can replicate, we can scale them up. We just need to redirect our efforts uh, again to those areas. So I think of the job guarantee as a national care act. So envisioning public service work that takes care of communities, takes care of the environment, takes care of people, importantly. I mean, this is a, a crucial piece. So, you know, look at programs that are very successful that deal with, for example, veterans, outreach veteran programs. Let's organize and scale those up. We have a program where we pay uh, caregivers to take care of veterans uh, that are returning. I will scale those up. I will involve veterans in outreach programs to other veterans. How about programs for former inmates? You know, this is a very big problem. Uh, The one that I'm referring to is the revolving door. People who leave prison are reincarcerated within two years. A very large proportion of them are reincarcerated. But there are good jobs programs that show drastic reduction in recidivism rates. So let's scale those up. Because one of the biggest impediments to integrating into sort of, you know, mainstream society and civilian life for a former inmate is precisely access to a job. And when the job is not there, there are very few options left. Let's think of young people who tend to have high unemployment rates, higher unemployment rates than average. And if you break it by race, you find that African-American and Hispanic youth experience really depression level unemployment rates. Well, we have had youth employment programs that have been successful. Again, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We just need to multiply these and uh, scale them up. So these are the sorts of things that that I will do. And I I think that what we would find is that exactly the most distressed areas that have uh, the ones that have the biggest number of unemployed people and the biggest needs. And so we could just do a little bit of coordination to match needs with resources. And what is the job guarantees? I don't know, you'd want to call it that the the people that are part of the job guarantee program, what is the relationship there between the public sector jobs and the private sector? Are the public sector jobs competitive with the private sector? And would people permanently stay in the public sector jobs? How do you, because I know that Warren Mosler says it's a transition job and I've heard different things from different people in the MMT community. Okay. So the program, as I have described it so far, is is a program that guarantees a right, that is a safety net, but it has these very unique ways in which it behaves uh, because it's a macroeconomic structural program. This is a a large scale, if you will, fiscal policy. Okay. So the program provides a public service job at a base wage. So let's call it 15 an hour, some basic benefits. And it is, because it's a public service job, it's a non-competitive job with a with a private sector. You know, we're not going to be doing the sorts of things that the private sector already does. You know, we we won't be producing cars, we won't be making rockets. You know, so we are going to be doing things that the private sector has not had an incentive to resolve. And usually, uh, you know, those are the the kinds of projects I just listed. But because it is a large program, it's a large fiscal impulse, if you will. It has, if you will, a counter-cyclical or beneficial impact on the aggregate economic activity. So the economy tends to move through these cycles. You know, it grows, it moves into recessions, then economies recover, you know, they grow, they move, you know, they decelerate, they move into recessions. You know, that's the normal cycle of a, of a market capitalist economy. And what ends up happening is unemployment is, is the one that, that shows these cycles. You know, unemployment accelerates and then decelerates and then accelerates again and then decelerates in recoveries. So this is, this is the stabilizer. You know, we, 
we provide people with unemployment insurance. We provide them with all sorts of income support programs. And that's how we stabilize this, this collapsing demand. Well, the job guarantee essentially does the same thing, except it does it better. We provide the government spends on employing the unemployed. That expenditure in and of itself is the kind of stimulus that the private sector needs to be able to recover. So let's think of it on a practical level. What does that mean? If somebody loses their job, they're laid off from Home Depot, and they have to cut on expenses. They have to cut on, you know, maybe summer camp for kids. Maybe they cut on going to the restaurant, going to the movies. And what that happen, what that does is actually it affects other private firms. But imagine if that unemployed worker from Home Depot is able then to go into the public sector and find a decent job at a $15 an hour. You know, maybe, maybe it will be less than what they earned in Home Depot, but they will still be able maybe to go to the movie. They will still be able to, you know, maintain their expenditures in ways in which they will not be able to do if they're on unemployment insurance. And that's really important because unemployment insurance expires where the job guarantee is there. It's a guarantee. You will, you will have this employment safety net for as long as you need it. And when the private sector recovers, you are welcome to transition back out of the program. And we will help you do that. If you want, we will help you get your old job back. We will help you get a new job back. So the job guarantee is three things. It is a, a program that guarantees a right, as I explained. It is an employment safety net as an alternative to the unemployment safety net, right? Unemployment insurance. So the job guarantee will provide an employment option in a downturn, and then we will help you transition out of it, you know, find your old, old job, get better paid, new jobs in the private sector. So it will also be a transitional program. So let me sum, sum it up again. The job guarantee is a, a program that guarantees a basic right, the right to a job. It is a program that offers an alternative to unemployment insurance, but it doesn't replace it. You can, you can choose, but it does give you an option, and that is an employment option, employment safety net. And finally, it's a transitional program because people can come in and go depending on the business cycle. And I, let me just say a couple of things about the business cycle. In the United States, unemployment is extremely volatile. It, it accelerates rapidly in a downturn, which means basically firms left and right do mass layoffs, thousands and thousands and tens of hundreds of thousands of people. And then they rehire them in an expansion, but at a slower rate. So if we were to have a job guarantee, a good number of those people will actually enter the program and replace their lost income with income from the job guarantee and employment, good employment opportunities. Then they will transition out in a recovery. So in a sense, we will make jobless recovery, a jobless recovery is obsolete. So because that's how the market economy moves and that's the cycle, uh, unemployment moves in this cyclical way. Well, the job guarantee will too except it's not going to have these enormous amplitudes because in a way the job guarantee stops the mass layoffs in their tracks. You know, if you, you know, if you've been laid off from your, from your job, but you're still able to get a good living wage job in the job guarantee, you might be able to finish that renovation project at home, you know, a kitchen renovation. And you might go back to Home Depot and get your cabinets, which means that you know, those people will not lose their jobs, uh, the cabinet, you know, people at the uh, at Home Depot. So you see, there is a much better stabilizer. And so there is an important synergy there between the public and the private sector that public employment actually gives is a better stabilizer to private employment than unemployment insurance. The uncertainty of unemployment insurance means that people pull back a lot. They cut on their expenditures in very drastic ways, and that impacts other employers, private sector employers. So there is that kind of synerg you know, synergy, that symbiotic relationship between the public and the private sector. The um, other relationship is 
a relationship of tension, I would say. So let me explain. On the one hand, the job guarantee is a better stabilizer to private sector employment. And, you know, you could you could look at our Levy Institute proposal. We've modeled it and it shows significant benefits to the private sector. But on the other hand, there is a little bit of a tension between the public and the private sector. And the tension is the following. If the job guarantee offers you $15 an hour, then that really puts pressure on private employers to match it. The federal minimum wage is a below poverty wage. You know, working people will, will live in poverty if they're only earning the federal minimum wage, depending on the size of their household. But if there's an option at 15 why would somebody work for a job that offers only seven or eight? And so in that sense, there is a tension between the public and the private sector, but that is no different than any other tension between other public policies and private sector policies. You know, we constantly pass, you know, labor laws and child labor laws and other regulations in the private sector. They come from the public sector. We put pressure on the private sector to do the right thing. And so the job guarantee is this, this mechanism, this, this uh, institution that does the same. It says, look, we believe that no one should earn below $15 an hour and no one should work without some basic minimum benefits. And here's your incentive uh, to match them. Based on numbers today, how many people do you think would transition into a job guarantee program? When we talk about a job guarantee, people really think that this is an enormous program, a daunting task. And, you know, I say several things. First of all, we always have millions of people who are unemployed. And those people need to be helped, managed in a way by the public sector, right? So we, are already, we already have a big program government program, but that's just called an unemployment government program. It is all the income assistance, all of the other support anti-poverty programs that are targeted towards the unemployed and so much more. We can talk maybe later about the social costs of unemployment, but they are quite large. And so imagine if you have to employ the unemployed, how many will show up? Well, officially, officially today we have about 6 million people who want work and cannot find it. Right? So this is important. We're not talking about employing every single person in the world. We're talking about the people who wish to work and are looking for work and cannot find it. There are lots and lots of people who do not want work, who are back in school, caregivers who cannot work and they need to be supported by other programs. But today, officially, we have about 6 million people who need a job. Now, there's also a fair amount of hidden unemployment. People, for example, who have the occasional job, they're working a few hours a week, they really can't make ends meet, or people who are juggling a couple of part-time jobs, but they really want a full-time job. And if you, if you try to add all of these uh, people who just don't have decent income or any income at all, you're usually looking at about double what the official statistics are. So let's just say about 12 million people come into the program. So, you know, is it difficult to employ 12 million people into the program? My answer to that question is, well, it is far better than trying to employ 20 million at the peak of the recession. So if you're going to be doing a job guarantee, it's really a good time to do it when unemployment is low, when you want to work out the kinks and when you want to start putting infrastructure on the ground to employ those people. But let me give you a, a, a comparison. So the job guarantee is, by all indications, a rather small program compared to other federal programs that we have. So think of Medicare. Medicare has 44 million people. Now, that has a fair amount of administrative oversight and compliance and management, etc. I mean, those people have to be overseen. Their bills, you know, do they qualify, do they not qualify, what is being paid, at what rate is being paid, that is an enormous administrative apparatus that has to deal with 44 million people in Medicare. Now think about Medicaid and CHIP, similar situation, but now we're talking about 70 million people, seven zero. Now think about public education. You know, public schools serve about 50 million students. 
And nobody is saying, oh, this is an administrative nightmare. We can't do this. You know, get rid of these public schools. I mean, there are, <laughs> there's a fair amount of attack on public school, you know, public education. But, you know, 50 million students are being served on an ongoing basis. And that's a right. We have guaranteed that right. So, you know, by comparison, I actually think that the job guarantee is very small. And on top of it, I keep emphasizing, we continue to employ administrative apparatus to deal with food stamps and unemployment insurance and various other uh, other programs. So we are just doing things better. That's what the job guarantee does. Yeah, one of the points that I found particularly persuasive with regards to the job guarantee was when, when I spoke about it with Randy Ray, he said, you know, look at what happens to people who are unemployed long term. You know, do they do they go and lead a life of crime? Do they end up in the prison system, which itself is a massive problem and, and a massive bureaucracy, which is, I think, what you know people fear the job guarantee could turn into. But we already have that, yeah. you know. Exactly. That's it. I mean, that's what most people don't realize is unemployment is paid for. And, you know, they, they just don't, don't realize what that means. So I have a paper. It's called uh, Unemployment, the Silent Epidemic, that basically attempts to tally all the social costs. And what I try to do there is basically go to the public health literature, the cognitive science, uh, sciences and economics of health, just find research on the impact of unemployment on you know, individuals and their families. And when you look at what, what is happening, and those whole costs are really very large and they're permanent. Like economists, the most that economists will talk about is the lost income, you know, that, that temporary or lifetime income, perhaps. Uh, they might talk about some scarring effects. But these, are, these, these run much deeper. You know, we have a permanent impact on mortality, for example. You know. So unemployment affects virtually all age groups and gender in terms of mortality. So even a short spell of unemployment has this kind of permanent effect. Then it turns out the the, me, uh, the medical costs are well documented. You know, physical and mental health, going more frequent visits to the doctor, increased expenditures on health care. Those are fairly well documented. Then the impact on spouses and children. So now we're talking about, you know, multiplied effects. And then it turns out that the children of unemployed also have negative effects in their labor market performance in terms of wages and labor market participation. None of this stuff makes it into the macroeconomic literature. So macroeconomists, when they talk about the natural rate of unemployment, they are not accounting for any of these costs. So as a society, we all pay these costs because healthcare is more expensive for us because we have you know, sicker kids in our schools and underperforming kids in our schools, not to mention crime and the opioid epidemic, which is a complex phenomena. But, you know, uh, absence of economic security is an important factor in the opioid epidemic. And so none of these things are accounted for. If you add them up, you will find that it is far better to simply give people jobs and just stop this avalanche of social destitution, social costs. So it's cheaper. On, on all counts, it's cheaper. And one thing that I, I like to stress out is that the job guarantees prevention. It's a preventative program. Like if, if the person keeps their job, you know, has a job or gets a new job, their kids, you know, is not going to go hungry. And so in a sense, you're preventing uh, another social problem from occurring. Mm-hmm. You're not just un- preventing unemployment from shooting through the roof. You're also preventing some of these social costs. So, you know, to me, the way we do things, you know, keeping some sort of natural rate of unemployment, you know, targeting that's sort of a policy guide by the Fed, that is a completely negligent policy response. It's extremely expensive and financial in real terms. And giving jobs is, is just sort of the, the, the positive better way of doing fiscal policy, a better stabilizer. And on top of it, you do investment, a human you know, investment in, in, in people rather than maintaining them in, in economic insecurity. Right. That actually leads into my next question, which I think is something that a lot of people don't understand, which is basically that as it is today, the policy, is, they, they do set unemployment targets. And I think people don't get that. You know, People think that the government is constantly 
trying to move towards full employment. Can you talk about how that's not necessarily the case and why that is? Not at all. In fact, absolutely. There is a concept in economics called the natural rate, or the other concept is the NIRU, and that's sort of a complicated way of saying, you know, there's some sort of ideal level of unemployment we are shooting for that's not going to create, you know, rapid inflation. So that concept, NIRU, is a concept that the Federal Reserve uses when they set interest rate policy. And I will just give you a recent quote by Fed Chairman Jay Powell. He said, you know, we need the concept of a natural rate of unemployment. We need to have some sense of whether unemployment is high, low, or just right. So they are looking, they're targeting a number of people who are out of a job. That's their job. Because they think that if for some reason that unemployment falls below that number, Wages are going to start increasing, God forbid. And if wages start going up, uh, then prices are going to go up. And then we're going to have some crazy inflation that nobody's going to like. This is just a really huge problem. Not only empirically, it has been a problem because unemployment rate regularly keeps falling and falling and falling. And we don't see any inflation on the horizon. But let me translate what this means. To put it in simple terms, what Jay Powell is saying is we're going to increase or lower the number of destitute people until we get it just right. Right. Like what kind of an econo- economic model right. is that? And, and, and the, the reason why I think this is sort of, I call it economic vandalism, is because, because you have a better option. If you want to stabilize prices, you can use the job guarantee. That's your counter-cyclical stabilizer. Uh, you can use that and just employ people, not you know, keep a reserve army of the unemployed. Why do you think the job guarantee is a superior option to UBI? What I want to say is that I generally don't object to income support programs. UBI, though, is a little different. You know, there are a whole bunch of versions out there, but the one that I object to is the universal basic income that is provided to every single citizen, rain or shine, at a living wage level. So, you know, Ivanka Trump gets her $35,000 a year and, you know, the little kid here in my inner city gets 35000 a year or let's say, eight, you know, uh, uh, over 18. You know, there's some proposals that it will be for people that are over 18. So why do I object to, to this? Most people won't tell you that, first of all, this is, this is about 25% to 30% of your GDP in terms of expenditure. And I'm not going to be worried about breaking the bank. That's from an MMT perspective. That's not what I, I'm concerned about. You know, you could send the check, no problem. But what I am concerned about is that that is a third of your output provided in the form of free money. And that's going to sort of cannibalize a lot of the resources. Like UBI doesn't produce anything, right? It's just a, it's a checks program. And so, right. you know, what, what is Ivanka Trump going to do with her $35,000? I mean, it's going to go straight into the investment portfolio, right? The kid in the, in the inner city, what are they going to do? Well, you know, maybe they'll go to college if, if they get admission, right? Maybe they'll be able to pay rent if there is a slumlord that will get them in. And what's the slumlord going to do? Is probably going to jack the prices of rent to extract. They, they know the kid has free money every year. The check comes in. You see, UBI doesn't change these awful power relationships that are on the ground. You know, people still need access to public goods. They still need, you know, affordable housing. They still need affordable child care, et cetera. And the job guarantee is it attempts to alleviate these shortages where the UBI magically assumes that they're going to just be alleviated just because we gave people a check. So, so those are, you know, those are really some of the, the practical aspects. But then let me go back to the other, the other question. The job guarantees fiscal policy. It's a counter-cyclical fiscal policy. It goes up and down with the business cycle and it stabilizes the business cycle. The basic income guarantee has no such function. That's a one giant money drop every year from the government that does not have the stabilizing function of the job guarantee. And the last thing I want to say about this is that 
I, I do believe that, you know, you know, poor, poor families do better if they get a little bit of income. You know, they're, they're good experiments that show, you know, cash assistance, etc. This is not universal basic income guarantee. But all of these experiments are looking at just some specific outcomes in the household, but people still need work. You know, I can give you an example. You know, at one point, the UBI community was so excited by the basic income policy in Iran a couple of years ago. But what did the government do? You know, they gave basic you know, basic income to everybody. They got rid of their fuel and food subsidies. People could not use their basic income to support themselves anymore. They were out in the streets rioting and they still wanted jobs. Unemployment was like something like 40%. So what I'm saying is it's no substitute to the problem of unemployment. When somebody wants work, work is the answer. You know, the Iran example for um, a UBI, are there real world examples in other countries of job guarantee programs that have been successful? Success. So the way you want to think about this is look at large scale programs and small scale programs. There is only one job guarantee program in the world that is enshrined into law as a basic human right. And that is the one in India called the uh, Rural Employment Guarantee, National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. It is um, it is somewhat limited because it guarantees only uh, 100 hours of work, 100 days of work, rather, to a poor family. And it has been under stress because uh, the government has tried to defund it. But it's a very different context. Obviously, India has massive poverty, but it has shown some very interesting positive results for people, like some asset creation for truly the poorest of the poorest communities, some green impacts from the projects that they're doing. You know, places that I would look to would be, you know, Scandinavian countries. For all intents and purposes, Sweden had an employee of last resort program all the way through the 90s. You know, it was somewhat different. It was the corporatist model, but there was an explicit commitment of the government that every person is going to have a job. So what the government would do is negotiate with firms and unions and they'll say, OK, all right, profits are down. How many people do you need to lay off? How many people are you going to furlough? How many people are you going to uh, keep? And so they will sit on the table. They'll negotiate. And those that have been left behind, the government will provide them public service employment opportunity. So it's, it's somewhat different from from the way I'm pitching it uh, for the U.S., but but the, the commitment was there uh, until sort of the dawn of the neoliberal era of the early 90s, and then that model was abandoned. I had um, studied one in Argentina with my colleagues. You know, we had been talking about the job, well, we used to call it ELR, Employee of Last Resort at the time. We were presenting in the early days, it was in 98, I believe, we were presenting the Employee of Last Resort. And by sheer happenstance, an economist from Argentina was sitting in the audience and then adopted the program in Argentina. So we went to study it and talk to ministry officials about the implementation management and look at the impact. I mean, you know, I've written about this. To me, this was a very formative experience. It was transformative for the communities and the people that worked in this project. And what was very interesting about this program is that it showed counter-cyclical features. It did show that the, the wage of this program was kind of the effective wage. Whenever somebody exited the Argentina program, they got a job at a premium above the wage that they got. You know, there are good, interesting wage effects in India as well. The program was counter-cyclical. As soon as the economy recovers, the program shrank. And this, you can see it through other programs. Then these are the big, large-scale programs that you can look to and see how they performed. Um, although most of them, you know, in Argentina, it was a crisis program, so it was phased out when the economy recovered. But then there are small programs that, are, that have very good lessons for us. I've looked at a, a couple of youth programs that show the impact on young people and how also young people transition quickly out of the program, such as the um, Youth Entitlement Program in the U.S. in the late 70s and the Future Jobs Fund in the U.K. after the great financial crisis. So, you know, we could document some of the impacts on young people, but 
you know, the one in the U.S. was very interesting because it wiped out all the, the differences in employment and labor participation rates between black and white youth. And so that was an indication that, you know, you know, black youth in this distressed communities were experiencing shortage of jobs. You know, it wasn't, you know, fallen moral character. There was, was just discrimination and no jobs. And once the jobs were there, they entered the program. They transition into stable other employment opportunities. And so we can look at, you know, small and big programs to see what are best practices. You know, how can we scale them up? Do you see any traction in terms of towards, you know, moving this forward? You know, it remains to be seen how this is going to play out. But yes, a few months ago, as you recall, a whole bunch of people came on board supporting the jobs guarantee, including Cory Booker that had uh, several co-sponsors, including Kamala Harris and Senator Elizabeth Warren. Bernie Sanders uh, has his own bill that we were able to contribute to with some feedback. Um, That's probably the biggest and boldest. Then Senator Gillibrand, she came and supported the job guarantee and Ro Khanna from California. Now, Alexandria Ocasio. So these people are on record and it will be obviously, you know, difficult to walk back, but let's see what they have to say in the election cycle. But the Green New Deal has sparked a different line of, of attack on this front just over the last few weeks and maybe month or two ago, you know, the Washington Post called the um, job guarantee a core element of the Green New Deal, and the Atlantic called it the single most crucial aspect of the Green New Deal. So now there is a fair amount of conversation about the job guarantee in the context of of the Green New Deal. And there are a couple of ways in which I see why it is so important. And, you know, the first one is that, you know, when you when you're going to do such a major if we were if we come to this point, you know, suppose that we were to do a mass mobilization and infrastructure investment to transition to green technology. And that's a fairly disruptive process for a lot of people in in uh, polluting businesses and industries. And so in large part, they're opposed to the Green New Deal because they have this economic uncertainty. So the job guarantee is a crucial piece because it is that safety net and it is that transition job where while we are incorporating people from polluting industries into clean industries. So that's one reason why it is is essential. But the other, the, the way I think about it, you know, there's another aspect is that even if it takes us a while to get to the Green New Deal and who knows what's going to happen. But in the meantime, our states and our coasts are ravaged by hurricanes and by storms and fires and tornadoes. The job guarantee is really essential because we have to deal with the fallout from you know, these climate changes. You know, people, they don't just lose their homes, they lose their jobs, they lose their communities and their livelihoods. So the job guarantee almost has to be a a precondition for doing a Green New Deal. So, you know, where the politics of this are at is we'll see whether there will be a concerted effort in, in Congress to push on those fronts. But what I have found enormously encouraging, and I just, you know, I surprising in a way, is that there is a grassroots movement asking for these policies. You know, the idea has taken a life of its own. You know, I'm hearing people talking about it, uh, you know, from unlikely corners and, you know, you know, just from various groups and organizations. And they are, they're starting to pay attention. And I think that this is the way change happens. So I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that we might be in this new phase of rethinking the role of the public purpose, rethinking the role of the state, recapturing, recapturing the state and saying, look, you know, we believe the state has a public purpose and we demand and ask of, of the state to, you know, help working people. And so that kind of turns the tide from the last 40 years. In it, you know, Reagan had an important revolution in terms of how, you know, we see government. And I feel that we are building the blocks towards a new way of thinking and speaking about the public sector and demanding concrete policies from the public sector. Definitely. Well, Pavlina, I know we're running out of time. Where can people find you online? 
they can look me up. I have a, a website, pavlina-cherneva.com. They can also look up the Levy Economics Institute, where most of my working papers are posted. I uh, can find me on Twitter. Uh, my handle is my first initial and last name, P T C H E R N E V A. I think that's that's it. Excellent. Thank you so much. That wraps up our episode. Hopefully you understand the job guarantee a little bit better now. If you'd like to learn more, please follow me at Adam A. Rice on Twitter. And the podcast handle is Pocket Change MMT on Twitter. You can also find the Pocket Change website at www.pocketchange.show. Again, thanks for listening and see you next time.